Thank you for coming out on this beautiful spring day. Finally, we get one. Uh, I wonder if we'll get, yeah, spring hour, probably correct. Now, keep hope alive, right? We've got to believe. Um, this evening's topic, salons and cafes, uh, will be the discussion. It's really a follow-on from last month's conversation. Um, so if you remember, we talked about conversation uh, as a shared attempt in speech for two or more people to create something outside of themselves greater than what they would be able to produce by themselves. And so it was a sort of shared communal effort of externalizing thoughts, ideas, reflections that made it such a unique and important contributor to the history of humanist literature, arts, every creativity, mathematics, and science. Now, um, the places where conversation has historically taken place are salons and cafes, hence the subjects of tonight's lecture. If you look at the, the little handout, hope everybody got one, I think this sort of sums up nicely what I would say is, is essentially the history, particularly here of, of, of the cafe. The first one is uh, from Jean Chardin, who was a, a French ambassador to Isfahan, um, which was then a center, Isfahan is half the world was the phrase, uh, was the center of the Persian Islamic empire that covered uh, I mean, everything. Uh, and and it, it, European ambassadors there tended to write back, wow, never coming home. Hope you all having fun there. Because uh, it's a very impressive city and it, it's still considered one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Difficult to get to because it's in sort of uh, Iran at the moment and so sort of difficult to negotiate. So he talks about cafes when he arrives there, one of the remarkable things he saw. People engage in conversation for it is there that news is communicated and where those interested in politics criticize the government in all freedom and without being fearful, since the government does not heed what the people say. <laughs> uh, innocent games resembling checkers, hopscotch, and chess are played. In addition, mullahs, dervishes, and poets take turns telling stories in verse or prose. So that's from uh, 1670s. You should all recognize that as a regular modern-day cafe. Uh, the coffee shop, particularly important in Islamic society, of course, because uh, wine is out outlawed. All alcoholic beverages are outlawed. Uh, and so they tend not to be consumed in public. Um, so the coffee shop became sort of the universal answer to the wine bar and the bar and everything else. Um, fast forward 300 years. Iran clamps down on coffee shops. They have become a haven for modern bookworms everywhere, a place to combine a love of the written word with the pleasures of cafe society. But now the trend of opening coffee shops inside bookstores has fallen afoul of the authorities amid a general clamp down on social and intellectual freedom. Four bookshops in Tehran this week closed their coffee shops after receiving a 72-hour ultimatum from Amak in Amumi, a state body governing the real t retail trade. The order has led to the closure of the cafe in one of the city's best-known bookshops, Nashur i Saleh, which has hosted reading sessions by writers including the Nobel Prize-winning Turkish author Orhan Pamuk and become a popular and become popular uh, meeting point for literary types. Awakened, uh, Amakan justified the closures by declaring that coffee shops constitute an illegal mixing of trades. <laughs> yes, however, critics suspect the move is aimed at restricting the gathering of intellectuals and educated young people. That's from a newspaper article in The Guardian in 2007. Uh, so Tehran is now the capital of modern-day Persia. This is what it is, Islamic country, of course, as it was in Sharan's time. Um, Huge shift in government attitude towards the coffee shop. No shift in what's going on in the coffee shop, right? It, it is the same. They were criticizing the government, complaining about things, arguing, debating, discussing in 1670s. 350 years later, doing the same thing in Persia. They've been doing the same thing in the tea houses and wine shops of China since at least the Song Dynasty, much earlier actually, but well documented from the Song Dynasty forward. Uh, coffee shops in England, of course, famous during the 17th and 18th centuries as fomenters of intellectual and political revolution. The cafes of Paris, of course, famous, you know, the Impressionists. We would not have the Impressionists without cafe society. Um, you have all the way up to the, uh, oh, I don't know, existentialist movement was born and raised in cafe society. Sartre and de Beauvoir famously lived in their cafes, essentially. A uh, Viennese cafe society, good Lord, you could go on and on and on. Um, so on one hand, you have the cafe, which if you think of the three, you've got public space, private space, and court space. Cafe is the most public, but notice it's not quite an entirely public space, and we'll talk about that. Next, you have the salon. Salons are famous, but they're a more private space. They're not the court, 
generally, though not exclusively associated with the courts, but they are mostly private, but not entirely private. They're also partly public. So we'll talk about this. So salons is sort of the private extreme, coffee shops the public extreme, um, always associated with, at least in historical development, government and courts. Again, that's why I like this comparison in the Persian context, over 350 years. The question is, is the government interested or not? The government's always interested. It's where they do anything or not, depending on the period and the time. But the original salon that we have good documentation for is, of course, Plato's Symposium. Right? This is the beginning, the most famous, and sort of the model which has been copied for whatever, the last 24, 500 years. If you're not familiar with the symposium, by the way, symposium, one of my favorite words, because it sounds good, it means drinking party. <laughs> uh, so the next time you, you see someone say, oh, there's going to be a symposium on this, show up with a keg. <laughs> and if they say, why'd you bring a keg? Say, you don't read Greek, do you? Right? So that's really, this is, this is what a symposium means. It means we're going to have a drinking party, but a drinking party with rules. The Greeks had very strict rules, that, generally not that well enforced, of course, as most strict rules are, but they had these very strict social customs about how much you could drink, when you could drink, uh, and, and very strict sort of moral public codes against getting drunk, which of course they flouted and made fun of each other for all the time. Uh, they also drank their wine heavily watered uh, to avoid getting <coughs> drunk. So what we would consider like regular strength wine, they might water that down by half, by just literally adding water. Um, and so they were drinking something like a wine cooler at, at, at most. And so, you know, if you have to drink a lot of those before you get drunk, if you run this experiment, you get a wicked headache more than you get drunk, right? Because of all the sugar. Uh, but maybe you haven't tried. Um, but so this is, this is the Greek model. They would gather, as you get in the symposium, which if you haven't read is a wonderful uh, document for this. It was just a social gathering in which people would discuss topics of the day, at least as we inherited it from uh, Plato. A couple of things are important about this. It doesn't seem like a big deal. People <clears throat> gather and discuss things. In ancient societies, private gatherings of numerous individuals were almost always prescribed by law. If you're having a wedding, okay. Major feast days, ooh, those are public. Those are held in the temples, the courts, palaces, something like that. If you were not gathering in the court or for some other official sanctioned space, it was basically illegal. Greek society is one of the first societies that said, hey, you know, it is okay for groups of people in Greek society, all men, to gather um, and discuss things. This is not actually a breach of law. The other thing you need, not only is a governing system that says that's okay, which again, historically, is often quite rare, uh, is you need private space. This is another thing that we take for granted for today, which is historically perhaps anomalous, maybe more rare, more, more, less common than more common, which is to say you need a space that 10, 12, 8 people can in fact gather in private. I mean, you need a fair amount of room and you need a cultural tradition that allows people into your home. Again, this is not universally acknowledged or accepted. This is a new development in ancient Greece and it's fallen out of favor. I was talking to a friend of mine from Ireland and he's about 50, uh, and he said he had known people for 30 years when he lived in Ireland, even when he was 30 years old when he came over here, and he had never been inside their home. You never went inside other people's homes. You just didn't do it. This is what the pub was for. You went to the pub, you saw everybody in the pub, you did everything in the pub. He says this has become less honored now in Ireland, he says, but it's still there pretty strongly. This notion that you just go over to people's houses, no, they were very private spaces. Only family members went into other people's houses. So that's what I say is salons are private, but not entirely private because you have strangers who are not your immediate family inhabiting the space where you live. And if you go to the symposium, you see this. It has, it has a wonderful beginning because uh, Socrates is going to this uh, to the symposium. Um, Ags and Amander's house, I believe. I should have looked that up. I believe it's Ags and Amander's house, but I forget. Uh, and, and he runs into somebody else, and he says, hey, why don't you come with me? And he says, no, no, I wasn't invited. Ah, oh, rule one for the salon. You're not allowed to show up randomly. Now, this is important. This is, again, this is back to the privacy thing. Different from a coffee shop. Essentially, you get to walk into a coffee shop. 
not so a private gathering. So one of the issues of the Salon that comes out right here in the very beginning is its selectivity. Who gets to decide who gets to come? How do they make those choices? And then how do the people who are invited respond to that opportunity? This will all play into how Salons work. So Socrates, in a huge piece of etiquette, but this is what Socrates did, he could get away with anything, said, no, no, you can come with me, I'm coming. They'll be happy to have you, I guarantee it. They, they said they would, wouldn't mind you coming. And so the guy goes, all right, I'll go with you. So they walk up to the house, and the guy knocks on the door, and he says, hi, I'm here with Socrates. He said I could, and there's no Socrates. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, this is awkward, right? This is that moment where now, now Socrates has put him in the place of having invited himself to a private party, and he's just standing out the door. And they're like, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Socrates will be out there someplace. So eventually they go and find Socrates, and they bring him in, and they all have this laugh and, you know, good joke about this. Ah, but here's what happens next. This is the other thing about the Salon. It is both an intellectual and a social institution. It is not this, right? This is not one person speaks, everybody else listens. The first thing that everybody does is, ooh, who gets to sit where? And one of the things that's going on is everybody wants to sleep with Alcibiades, who's there. Alcibiades wants to sleep with Socrates. It's not clear Socrates wants to sleep with anybody. And so one of the things that goes on in the symposium is all of this sort of attempts to seduce other people who are at the symposium. And of course, the topic on which they're speaking is the nature of love. And so there's all this great double and triple levels to these conversations when they're talking about who should be loving whom, under what circumstances, and, and all of the games that are being played around love here. So this is the next thing to keep in mind. Salons are invariably also social. Friends, connections, business, uh, sexual uh, relations are all played out within the context of this semi-private setting as we get from the discussion that you get in the symposium. So then they all actually talk about the fact that, well, there was a big party last night. We got pretty drunk, so we don't want to drink too much tonight. So does everybody agree we'll just drink a little bit and talk? And they all say, yes, that'll be a great idea. A little bit and talk. And they say, so the subject will be, again, love. Well, we're going to say thanks to Eros for the you know, wonderful thing that love is, and we'll discuss that. And so they start going around the room. And this quickly devolves into a discussion of what does love mean? What does sexual lust mean? And they debate this, which is another element of the salon, which is the ostensible topic is immediately gone, and they're on to whatever topic comes up. The third element, okay, so there we get the privacy issue, we get the social issue, uh, and then we get the notion that it is an interplay. It's lively. It's not a fixed forum where people you speak and then sit down and the next person speaks and sit down. It's, it's a live exploration of these ideas. Um, finally, you get Aristophanes' speech, which is, which is brilliant. I think Aristophanes is, is arguably the greatest Greek philosopher. I mean that quite seriously. I think he's hugely undervalued. Um, and so he gives what is simultaneously the funniest speech, because you know, Aristotle is a great comedic playwright, but I mean, his speech on love is absolutely hilarious, because that's what Aristotle did. And he introduces this notion that at a symposium, you're supposed to be, salon at a symposium, you're supposed to be entertaining. It is not enough to just go and be. You are there in part because you have something to contribute to the other people who are present. It's like a, a buffet, a, 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 a potluck, but it's an intellectual, emotional, spiritual, artistic potluck. You are, it's not okay to show up with nothing or half a bag of chips, right? We've all seen this at the potluck and you're like, wow, that, that's really, come on now, really? You know, we've seen this, that is not okay. I mean, people do it, of course, because we're people, but you're supposed to come with something to contribute. What, Aristophanes contributes is both entertaining, ah, but also brilliance. Um, and he launches what I believe is the first ever recorded defense of, of uh, sexual freedom and license. He's like, he says, look, some men are, are only attracted to women. They should only be with women. Some men are only attracted to men. They should only be with men. Some women are only attracted to women. They should only be with women. People who are contracted in marriage, they should probably stay faithful to each other. That's for the best. But if women do not want to contract in marriage, they shouldn't have to. They should be as free as men should be free. So he makes this 
plea for human sexual liberty and equality, which is, like I said, you know, it's 2,500 years ago. We're still arguing this stuff out. Uh, and it, he just states it so clearly and, and so hilariously that you kind of almost have to say, well, he wins, Aristophanes wins, right? Uh, and Socrates' response is so baffling and off-topic, uh, as, as it usually is, that you're thinking, well, let's go with Aristophanes. But then the conversation rolls on. And you get, the, again, this great interchange. Everybody contributing what they, they have to bring. And then at the end of it, Alcibiades, who, if you know anything about Greek history, he's an amazing character. He was... He fought for the Greeks and he betrayed the Greeks and he came back and fought for the Greeks and he betrayed the Greeks and they brought him back a third time. And then he, I mean, he was just, you're like, really? It's, it's, he's an amazing character. He's handsome, wealthy, powerful, brilliant, apparently completely without morals. <laughs> I mean, really, his history suggests a, like a totally amoral person. Um, and he says in his speech at the symposium, at the end, everybody else has spoken like, well, Alcibiades, the young, brilliant, handsome lad that we all want to sleep with. Uh, what do you have to contribute? And he says, I want to say, I don't care what all of you have said. Only person here that matters is Socrates, because he's the only person here who ever makes me feel shame. And Alcibiades breaks like the cardinal rule of the salon, which is he makes everybody else uncomfortable, including Socrates. And he brings it, he brings it to an end. This is the end. We're now done. Because his speech about Socrates to Socrates and basically just rubbishing everybody else who's there for being third-rate human beings. Then they all just say, well, let's get drunk then. And they all get drunk. That's literally, that's how it is. I'm serious. This is the how it is. And Socrates doesn't get drunk and just leaves when they all pass out. That's the conclusion of the symposium. So, that, you know, like people talk about this whole, you know, great, airy uh, Greek philosophy. A lot of it's not that airy. Um, but... What you get in the symposium is the complete arc of the rules of the salon. Selectivity. The obligation on the people who are attending to bring something. You have to come with something that you're contributing. Manners. What Alcibiades does is a huge breach of etiquette. But he's, that's what he does. He always breaches the etiquette. He's like the negative Socrates. Um, and by contributing and sharing and having a context in which we have an agreed amount of uh, what we can and can't do, what is okay and not okay, mixed with the social element of sexual seduction, making friends, making acquaintances, building a, a, a network, generates the capacity for people to really build uh, aesthetically pleasing, artistically, intellectually powerful communities. Um, the salon took a bit of a nosedive when Greece gets destroyed, um, because, of course, the next government was not so lenient about these things. You have the tyranny of the 30, which killed a lot of people off uh, at 300, and then the 30, and then, of course, you had the invasion of uh, Philip of Macedon, who really put a stop to anything that looked fun. And, and so the, it, it's on hold. During the Roman Empire and Republic, it never quite comes back entirely because they, their Roman Republic was not that Republican, and then Roman Empire was really mostly very horribly, you know, repressive and not very nice. Uh, and so they didn't allow things. Again, public and private meetings of this kind are outlawed once again. Fast forward, oh, you know, a thousand years or so, uh, 1,500 years to the Renaissance. Again, everything Greek. Renaissance, right? That's how it goes. Oh, we're going to talk about uh, Japan and China in just a second. Um, you have the court world. Now, it's important to note that the salon is not the court, often associated with the court. But all you have to do to figure out why the salon is not the court is imagine if you've ever been at work when somebody said something that you thought, that is morally offensive, politically off track, really stupid, but you realize that you just can't say anything because you're at work. So you just smile and nod, right? It's just, just, you know, if you've ever had that moment, you understand in tiny why the court cannot be the salon. There's lots of things you can't say at court, most notably the king sucks, right? And this is the rule number one. Uh, and there's a lot of rules that follow from there. And since you're at court where all the politics is going on, not being able to talk about things like, oh, politics is a bit repressive. In the 16th century, you have lots of courts. 
And a lot of them have no political power whatsoever. I mean, to go in that structure takes too long, but you had these just weird vestigial, you had like bishops of districts that didn't exist, but they're still drawing salaries that they have to spend on something, so they set up a court. Well, it's very liberating, because now you have a court that has no politics, and since the bishop was probably, you know, only so vaguely Catholic, it's hard to imagine, he didn't care what people said, he wanted to have a good time. And so you get the, when you, if you read Castiglione's The Courtier, this is what they're talking about. How do you have a society in which educated people gather to discuss issues? How do you set this up? And, hugely important for what's about to follow, you get the arrival of women. Remember, Greek society, think modern day Taliban. Their view on women, not real forward looking. Uh, it, they're hugely repressive, women segregated off. Um, in the 16th century, noble women, primarily, or very wealthy merchant prince women who tended to become noble shortly thereafter, like the Medicis were not originally a noble family, they just became so rich, they you know, bought all the nobility and the Pope papacy and everything else he could buy, um, can attend salons. Why? Because they're semi-private. The original word salon comes from the fact that women would entertain while they were in bed. So they would sit in bed, and their intimate friends would join them and sit around the bed, and they would chat and hold sort of court. Now this was a model of the imperial court. If you were the highest ranking members of the court, then you were allowed into the emperor's, the king's bedroom. This was, this, this was a member of the chamber meant the chamber. You got to go to him when, with him when he went to the bathroom. This was literally the highest you could achieve. Because it meant you had, no, I'm serious. This was this meant chamber, like chamber pot, right? I mean, this is uh, being able to be intimate with, both physically and in time, with the emperor conferred huge power, huge authority. Because all power comes from this person, so access to this person is what matters. So when people started setting up their salons, particularly women, they did the same model. Here I am in bed, and I have my servants bring things in, and then my friends gather and we discuss what? Ah, everything. This is the key element. Here I am. I'm an educated, capable woman. For the first time, we get large numbers, I mean, relative to history, not relative to the population of women, but relative to history, large concentrations of women of really first-rate education. They've gone through the trivium system that we discussed. They've been reading the books. They've been learning their Latin. They've been seeing the art. They've been listening to music. What outlet do they have for their capacities? None. Only through the salon. And so they bring everything into the salon, everything that's out in the world that they're not allowed to go out into, the political arena, military arena, uh, engineering, science, mathematics, literature, the arts, dance, music, whatever it is. For a long time, women are not allowed to go to public music concerts. So how do you hear concerts? You bring them into your home. They're not allowed to study math or go to the science demonstrations that are start going on in the 16th century. How do they bring those people into their homes. And so they form these incredibly powerful salons. Now what they bring, one is sort of they have nothing to do. And so they have money and time and no outlet. So they become the backers. They become the power people. They say, look, I'm in court. You need a position in court. You come to my salon. I'll get you hooked up with a salary. And then you can do your uh, you know, alchemical researches, or you can do your astronomical researches, or you can write your poetry. And so they wielded real power. And they formed these coteries of, of, again, artists, musicians, the whole humanistic world, because if you're a musician, what else are you going to do? If you're an artist, whatever access, if you don't have court access any other way, make yourself charming, make yourself handsome, make yourself available. By the way, there you are in her bedroom, very convenient. Why don't you stay back? I would like to chat with you a little more about your ideas about music. Oh, why, yes, thank you very much, ma'am. You know, I think I shall, right? So this is, it's all working. All these dynamics work simultaneously. Um, 
So it's this weird, or historically anomalous space opens up that generates real power because it's not public. It has resources, most notably lots of intelligent, well-educated women who have no other outlets for their capacities. And it has the new educated elite rising up that needs access to, again, money and the court. And so this all starts to form these coteries that produce things. Things like, oh, Mozart, for instance. Where does a Mozart come from? Mozart, I mean, one of the things people always talk about read Mozart biographies, oh, so terribly never could get a court-appointed life salary, right? Everybody said, he, well, the reason he couldn't is because he was an idiot at that stuff. He, he was brilliant in the salon. He would go to the salons, show up, and people said, by far, the most brilliant musician and composer we've ever seen, but socially completely inept. You can't send him to court. This is the response over and over. Classic example, he was in Paris. He went to a salon. I can't remember the lady's name. Um, and one of the court composers, the Kapellmeister, was there. I think this was in Vienna. So major court. Mozart, in theory, really wants to get on with these people. So the Kapellmeister's there, and, and, and Mozart, having heard one of this guy's pieces, said, oh, I'll play this for you. So he plays it beautifully, of course, and the Kapellmeister is very flattered. He's like, oh, you know, Mozart, this noted uprising performer, remembers one of my pieces and plays it. And then Mozart then proceeds to, like, rewrite it and perform, like, <laughs> 17 variations, all of which are so much better. <laughs> that, and then he writes letters to his mother and his sister that say, oh, I met the Kapellmeister, I played his music, he loves me, I, I think I'm in. Everybody else at the evening wrote, Mozart is the biggest idiot. He's a brilliant musician, but good Lord, he just destroyed the Kapellmeister. He's never going to get a job in this court. Right? He has no, now he's just burned all of his bridges before he even knew they were there. Right? And so it was this space where you could negotiate these kinds of things. Is Mozart the kind of guy who could get on a court? No, never, never. He would never have succeeded at court. He would never have existed in a court society because he was just oblivious. As far as we can tell, he didn't mean to do it. He was just oblivious. Um, Beethoven, the same thing. I mean, Be Beethoven meant to do it. Beethoven was actively, aggressively rude to the nobility. He, every opportunity he got to piss them off, he took it. He, he kept telling them they were nothing. He, he kept saying, man creates nobility, God creates musical genius. You are nothing. <laughs> he, he literally, that's a direct quote from Beethoven. <laughs> right? I, I may have mentioned there's this famous scene between Goethe and Beethoven where they meet and they're walking along. It's recorded by several people, including Goethe. And, and these, uh, like, Duke and Duchess and their party is coming towards them. And, of course, Goethe, who works at a court, steps aside and bows to them. And everybody's, oh, gracious, you know, Goethe, he's the man. Beethoven just walks right through them. <laughs> and Beethoven said to Goethe, you should never do that. You're a genius. They're dirt. You make them kiss your boots. <laughs> and Goethe's like, why do you make so much trouble for yourself? It, life is hard enough. Why go out and seek to offend people who can help you? This is um, just the different natures of their genius. But Beethoven and Mozart only existed from the commissions they got through the salons. This is how they made their way in the world. They were never going to be good enough to make it at court. There was no private money at that time in the sense of like concert halls and things that hadn't developed yet. Right at the end of, of Beethoven's life, he might have been able to do a little something, but it would have been far too late for him then. The, 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 the public sphere of concert performance doesn't exist yet, but it was going to the salons, playing the pieces in front of people, and then going, oh, I'd love to commission a piece from you. Great, you know, here's some money. Mozart, this is what he did for his whole life. Beethoven occasionally had court appointments, but they didn't usually amount to much, and they were very unstable for various reasons, but mostly because he was a bastard. Um, you know, and so this is what the salon allows you to develop. Probably the greatest example of the salon person is Voltaire. And Voltaire makes the difference between public, private, court, and salon just as clear as it could be. Early in his career, and this happened over and over again, he is writing and performing plays that he gives in noble salons. Not a member of the nobility himself, so he is able to raise himself up to the highest level of society through his intellectual and a literary genius. So that's part of what the salon allows. It brings people previously completely excluded for power 
into a relationship with power. So he does these plays, these quips, everything in the salon. Everybody loves him, including the king. King loves him. In private, he's writing these brutal satires of the exact same people. That's fine. Nobody cares. Ah, then he has his plays performed publicly. Now that is different. Literally, he gets arrested under the writ of the king for doing a play that is offensive to the dignity of the king and put in the Bastille. While he is in the Bastille, the king's like, God, I hate to do that to, to uh, Voltaire. I love him. He's just great. He's hilarious. As in private, I think he's wonderful. In public, he insults the dignity of the king. I can't have it. While he's in the Bastille for insulting the dignity of the king, which is a, theoretically a capital offense, by the way. He ends up being exiled briefly. Um, the king awards him a gold medal <laughs> for literary achievement because he loves him so much. So that, see, you see that the three different spaces in the salon, it's great because in the salon we're all, it's, it, there's this illusion that we're all together. Now they weren't all together, but there's this illusion that it's all okay. This isn't going to have any effect. Privately, you're pretty much totally free. Publicly, ooh, no, no, no. Voltaire continually overstepped those bounds. He was continually being arrested, uh, censured, censored, exiled throughout his career. Loved him in private, loved him in the salon setting, but too public was too much. And so that was the weird sort of space that was created by the existence of the salon. And this goes on and on uh, um, because it wasn't public, it wasn't quite totally private, someone from outside the nobility could get in. By the way, we like to think this is dead, and in some ways I'll talk about where we are today, it is dead, but notice that the court is not gone. The court has simply become government and business. It functions in exactly the same way. People go, oh, we're free to say whatever you want, da, da, da. You know, right, sure, if you work for Coke, walk into work with a big Pepsi t-shirt and a Pepsi. <laughs> Just run that experiment. See how that goes. It's not going to go well, but I say try it anyway, right? It'll be fun. Um, you know, these, these, uh, so people might think you're joking, but if they didn't think you were joking, you would be in trouble. I don't know if people know the British Airways now is, is saying that um, their employees, they have a rule, no jewelry. You can wear no visible jewelry. And so now there's a big court case because some of their employees were wearing crosses that were visible. And British Airways says, well, you're fired unless you take off the jewelry. And so it's a sort of religious freedom versus uh, self-expression and, 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 you know, the right to work issues and the company policies issues. But notice, that's just a company policy. You can't wear jewelry. We would never allow the government to tell us we couldn't wear jewelry. But how much of our time is spent in spaces like corporations, companies, businesses, where we work, where we have to deal with people, where we do? Right? So that influence of the environment in which our freedoms of expression and thought and, and, and self-realization is highly prescribed, uh, it still exists today. We just don't call it a court anymore. It's, it's government and it's business. And in the, if you have any doubt about this, try to fly someplace. Right? Or they just take your shoes off, strip search you, run you through these machines. Oh, wow. Yeah, you just have no liberties, right? I mean, we just, we just give them up. Uh, that, that is that sphere. That is the sphere of the court that exists. We just don't call it a court anymore. That's the kind of power. Um, l last example, I think, for the Salon is, is important to think of as Talleyrand. If anyone knows, he's one of my favorite historical figures I've mentioned before because he used the Salon and the women of the Salon um, so systematically and so well, it was just astounding. He was... He had the best spy network in Europe because he was connected to every salon in Europe through all the women who ran them. And they loved him because when he was in power, which was basically all the time, um, he let them have a say. He gave them a role behind the scenes, but a very palpable role in government. And so whatever Talleyrand wanted, if they could deliver it, they delivered it. Plus he was handsome and he, was, he seduced them and they seduced him. And there was this whole program that he ran all over. But he, everywhere, all over Europe, not just in France, it was in Germany, it was in Russia. Talleyrand famously, by the way, was the negotiator between Napoleon and the Tsar of Russia. He worked for both of them simultaneously and translated the treaty back and forth. 
So he would go to Napoleon and say, what do you want? And he'd say this. He'd go to Tsar Russia, what do you want? Okay, I'll get that for you. And then he'd go back to Napoleon. And so he wrote the treaty he wanted, of course, which was, had nothing to do with what Napoleon or Tsar, the Tsar wanted. It was what Talleyrand wanted, because he was, he was the guy. I don't know how he does that. Anyway, he was an amazing guy. But one of the reasons he was doing that is he had the best information because he had all the noble women in, Tsar, in, the, in the Tsar's court reporting to him. He had all the noble women in France reporting to him, and all the major noble women and everybody except England, he struggled with England, um, reporting to him all the time. So he knew what everybody was doing, what they wanted, well before they did, and then he was able to negotiate under those circumstances, which helps you win. Um, so this is sort of the, your brief history of the salon and what it gives you and how it's existed. Uh, the cafe, has a longer historical reach because I said if you go back into ancient China with the development of the tea house and the wine shop um, and the gathering of poets, I don't know how many Chinese poems there are to tea, tea houses, wine, and wine shops, but it's a lot. I mean, it is thousands and thousands. Li Pao, who was famous for having written, I think, a thousand poems on that subject alone himself, um, some of their greatest literary, literary flourishings happened this time. But this is the history of the coffee shop right here, the cafe. This is why I wanted to give this to you. is because it is the more public space. And because it's the more public space, it has been the one more commonly suffering from government intervention. One way to read the history of the tea house in China in particular is you have sort of a loose tea house. You have the literati gathering, discussing, and talking. And then it gets formalized. The rules for tea in which you see something like the Japanese tea ceremony today, which is borrowed from Song uh, Dynasty traditions in China and developed, uh, is to close off the tea house as a place of discussion. You bring it into the court, you ritualize it, you formalize it, which means everybody has to shut up and do what they're told. And this went on and off again in China. It's like a sort of a heartbeat in Chinese history. Government loosens up, rules of trade and travel free up, the literati get sort of freed up a little bit, and all of a sudden you get these, these you know, cultural fluorescences that China is famous for. The tea shops flourish, the wine shops flourish. And then there's various kinds of crackdowns. But one of the most interesting I always find is when the public sphere of the tea house is repeated, not once, it's happened several times, is drawn into the court. It's formalized. The rules are laid down. Ah, well now there's no talking about how bad the emperor is or, or discussions of things not specifically relegated. So again, it's, there's been this issue. This, again, China has a great history of this. The Islamic, I mean, I don't know, Islamic art and letters is the letter of the work of the cafes. You have the court poems and the court works, which are fine. They're almost unreadable outside their languages because they're noted for the beauty of the calligraphy, and the beauty of the prose. But the content tends to be terrible because they, so the, you know, Pasha is wonderful. Allah has blessed him. We are so lucky to work for the Pasha. Isn't the Pasha great? For a thousand lines, you're like, okay, this is, this is boring. This is, all it was was how beautifully could you say we really love the guy who's in power? How blessed we are to have him. Ah, the works that come outside of that come essentially from cafe society. Again, wine and beer theoretically outlawed, although in practice not really, but the so public consumption of it. So the cafes were then and are today in the Islamic world the gathering places. If you want to know what's going on, you go to the cafes. All over the Middle East, same thing today, which is why in you know, 2007, in Iran, they're cracking down on these. They know where the problem is. Same thing in Syria today. They keep, what do you do? You close down the coffee shops. Why? Because after everybody talks about things. You can censor the press. You can keep people from gathering in large audiences in the squares, but what the hell are they doing in those coffee shops? Ooh. I mentioned last time, the first thing the Nazis did in the Anschluss into Austria is they killed the people who were at the coffee shops. This seems like I'm making this up. It is literally the first thing they did. They had to have, they, I mean, they, they, we don't have the list, I don't think we have the list at least, but the major figures of Vienna Cafe Society were arrested in under 12 hours. So there's no, it was not an accident. There were the Austrian police, who were clearly in collusion with the Nazis, were waiting. Who did they want to arrest? They wanted to arrest the guys in the cafes. It's amazing. 
Why? Because of the intellectual, social, artistic ferment that this space allowed. And it seems to be true everywhere they traveled. So if you look in the history of England, 17th and 18th century, you get the development of cafe society, which is an important shift. I mean, there's essentially prior to the late 16th century, early 17th century, you couldn't drink the water because it would kill you. And people knew this. People were not foolish. And so what do you drink? Wine, beer, cider, rum, hard alcohols of bark, all kinds. It is not an exaggeration to consider most of the population drunk most of their lives. <laughs> this was this, and so this was one of the issues. The switch to a beverage like coffee, boiled water. Ah, notice this. They, you, to make coffee, you have to boil the water and you roast the beans. It's essentially a sterilizing process. Look, something we can drink and we don't die of cholera. This is great. This is a huge innovation, right? It seems trivial to us. Like, well, of course not. But no, 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 this is no of course about it. It used to die of cholera when you drank things that weren't alcoholic. Um, and, and so there's like, hey, this is great. And so a, a society started to form around these institutions, beginning in Oxford and then spreading out. Uh, and you're not drunk. Not being drunk is helpful towards sort of, you know, reason discussion. So, uh, you know, so the huge contributions to the development of the Enlightenment begin to take place in cafe society. Interestingly, you get like the Scriblarias, I don't know if people have heard of this, which was a sort of Whig reactionary party is in a coffee shop at the same time that the Spectator is, is launching, you know, the modern English essay as we know it in a coffee shop not too far down the road. Now, they weren't totally unattached to the court. Um, what they were is you would have sort of the, the literary guys or the scientific guys who had had commissions from the court, which means they had access to the court, would set up in a coffee shop. If you're a young literary person, researcher, scientist, whatever, who wants access to the court, which is all good things come from the court, then you would go to that coffee shop, talk to them, and they could essentially get you an introduction. So like the salon, it acted as a, a median space where the general public could come into contact with people who were in contact with a very private space. Obviously much more public, which works better in a country like England. The salon develops later in England than it does in France. The cafe society develops in France as the salon dies. The salon develops in England as the cafe society dies because they reverse their political structures. We'll talk about this. Um, so again, it provides this medial space where uh, someone who's from outside the circles of power can meet somebody within the circles of power and perhaps gain access to it. It was part of the development of more personal freedoms, the spread of education, the spread of economic opportunity, the rise of the middle class. This all goes hand in hand. But it also meant, of course, slowly declining power of the court. That's the only thing that this can lead to. Because if people outside the court are gaining influence and power, the court must be losing it. So uh, today, I think the greatest example of this is all over Africa and Asia, you have the rise of the internet cafe. How do you get information? How do you, it used to be newspapers. Word of mouth, newspapers. Now it's the internet. What do you get? You get internet cafes. All over Africa, this is hugely controversial. Governments go, nope, that's it, we're cracking down on Sudan. Nope, no more internet cafes. Why? Well, because people read the news. They find out things. They get educated. They educate themselves. They watch MTV. You know, whatever it is that people want to do, they get to do there. And they're gathering in groups. And then, you know, time passes and they start starting them up again. But in countries where you can't afford your own computer, and you certainly can't afford to pay monthly internet access fees, being able to pay a small fee to sit someplace where there are computers and you can talk to people who are using the computer ahead of you or behind you, go as a group of friends, all share the computer. Ah, this works both economically and socially. And the governments know this, so same thing. What do you do? You crack down. I mean, it's just a revolving crackdown. Internet cafes, they get shut down and then they get opened back up again. They get shut down and get opened back up again. Same thing happened with the coffee houses. You used to pay one penny fee to get into the English coffee houses. But they had the newspapers there that you could read. So people who could not afford to subscribe to the newspaper, but who now had learned to read, 
could pay a very small fee, get some coffee, and read the newspaper. Wow. Governments were not slow to figure out the import of this. And so it was like, hey, these people are starting to educate themselves. They're starting to get their own ideas, like access to the internet. This, this is like the old slow internet, right? Uh, and so this was this, 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 you know, so they would crack down on it. They would eliminate it. Interestingly, England finally figured out the key to eliminating the cafe as an important influence in society, by the way. They created the private club. And what the private club did is it sucked all the people who had access to the court out of the cafes and put them in these private clubs where they self-selected the members. So the private clubs became like a very small salon that didn't do anything. And so now the cafe lost all of its capacity to generate sort of contact with the court. And this worked brilliantly until, of course, the court ceased to exist as an important institution. Uh, but it did kill the cafe. So there's this amazing sort of rise of cafe society, which was then killed. In Vienna, the cafe society, of course, wasn't killed until the Nazis got there. Um, and, and again, I, I was trying to come up with a list of, of cafe society importance. I mean, I, so I just went with big names, like the secessionist painting movement, which is, you know, Klimt and Bloch and all those guys. I mean, in Vienna, the list is like literally hundreds of names long. Uh, existentialist philosophy, the Impressionists. Um, in China, I mean, the Chinese poets that talk about the wine bars and the coffee shops is, is almost endless. You know, so they have this huge intellectual from it. By the way, the sciences, the same Freud mathematicians, there was one famous cafe, I can never remember the name, in Vienna where all the mathematicians hung out. Uh, there's a famous mathematician in France who was created by a group of mathematicians who all went to the same cafe. Uh, and they published papers under this name of this fictitious guy. Because <laughs> they would just work stuff together in the cafe and they'd publish it under this name of this person who didn't exist. So it was like, the, like this model of the cafe society. Oh, we get together, we work on stuff, and then we publish it. Who cares? That's just fun. That's what the cafe is about. So again, it's not, not only not just the literary arts, it's political issues, it's aesthetic issues, it's science and mathematics, it's the free exchange of ideas in whatever field. Hugely powerful um, in moving the humanist tradition. So where are we today? This is, this is always a big question. On salons, I think we're exactly nowhere. I think we're practically or nearly dead, uh, which I think is unfortunate. We always like the idea of the salon, but it's a very difficult thing to pull off um, for a number of reasons. One. You need the hostess. Doesn't have to be a hostess, could be a host. Historically, it's been a hostess. Women have done this. This is no small, this is always a recognized art form. The person who could select people, who, when they mixed, would form a company that could, in fact, enliven each other, enrich each other, entertain each other. Uh, the sort of negative example, if you've ever read Dostoevsky's novels, he always formed parties of people who were going to immediately tear each other to shreds, which is one of the entertaining things about his novels, but it's the anti-salon. You don't want uniformity, because uniformity just we all stand around and agree with each other. Ah, but you don't want such diversity or such loggerheads or such aggressive individuals that nothing beautiful or creative or, or productive can come of it. And so that mix of people, you need some artists, you need some musicians, you need some politicians, you need some beautiful women, you need some beautiful boys, right? You need to mix all those in there. Create the atmosphere. Then you need a pleasant environment. This, I think, may be the biggest problem. People like, oh, we're going to have a party, we're going to talk, whatever. Almost invariably, too much noise. It's too loud, it's too many people. Right? How are you supposed to talk and carry on a conversation, a very extension of the conversation idea, in a place where there's too much noise or too many people? Right? So you end up with a, you've got a drink in one hand, and you've got food in the other hand, and the music is playing, and you have no place to sit down, and you're being introduced to 12 people. Right? Well, I, I, what the hell are you supposed to do with that? Right? I mean, really, literally, there's no, this is not productive. And so the art of creating an environment where people feel comfortable, they feel like they have the opportunity to express themselves without being, you know, either horribly judged or attacked or in some way uh, brutalized socially or personally. Um, 
this is again, this has always been recognized as not a small art form. And so the women, particularly, who were famous for this, tended to have salons that would run for like 60 years. You know, they would set them up when they were 19 and beautiful and newly married, and their you know husbands were God only knows where they were never seen. Um, and then you know, literally, they would be 75 or 80, and they'd still be in their Paris hotel uh, or, or in their country house in England, having the salon. It just, it just kept going and going because they had the touch, they had the knack, they had that art. And they, and they dedicated themselves to this. They knew who was doing what. They knew who was interested. They knew who was sleeping with whom, who wanted to sleep with whom, who was researching what, who had the grants, who had the money, who had the connections with the publishers, who was the rising MP, who was the governor that was about to get promoted to Secretary of State. And they just kept all this moving. And it created this sort of excitement. Um, one, one famous salon in Paris, one night, one night had the mayor of Paris, Proust, Picasso, uh, de Galliev, Stravinsky, D.H. Lawrence, and there's one more, I always forget the last guy, and, and other people. But I, you know, that was just like, wow, right? What a salon. Um, and, we, and, and almost no one mentioned Proust because he apparently was quite quiet. Uh, often in social engagements. But he was watching, as we all know. He was watching very carefully uh, what everybody else was doing. Yeah, so, so that sort of environment where then, you know, Picasso and Lawrence could talk and go and argue and disagree but feel like they're enriching each other and, and adding to each other uh, was, was significant. Um, but I have hope. I mean, people, it may, it may be resurrected. We'll see if, if people begin to care about these things. Uh, cafes, on the other hand, this is a new, quite interesting development. I think the internet cafes, again, in Africa and all over Asia, this is, I think, is hugely significant. Again, it's hard for us to get our minds around the notion of people who, one, have no private space, right? They, they do not have houses with rooms. They have a room that they share with six, seven, eight, nine, twelve people, literally. India, same thing. Um, Public gatherings tend to be frowned upon or dangerous, literally, because they, you know, they're, they're either tribal or they're political, and both those things get you in trouble. Um, so you have a cafe where you can go. It's public, but you can also go with your friends and gather. And you can access the whole world, or the amazing world of the Internet, get the information you want. You know. How bad is our government? Who's stealing what from whom? What's going on with our environment? What's my favorite band doing? You know, all these things that are important to people. And, and that bring it to them and then share it interpersonally. This is the other key. If I go to the internet cafe, I go home and remember there's 12 people there. They want to know. They're like, what did you read? What did you hear? What did you see? What is everybody talking about? So it creates these big networks. So internationally, I think this is a, a, a fascinating time of the cafe. Uh, then we have the notion of, of, of an institution like Starbucks. I'm not, not a big fan of the Starbucks, but notice what it points to. It points to a desire of people to have a facility like a cafe. And talk to anybody who owns a nice cafe, like the Undertown, we're lucky to have a very nice cafe. All these wonderful cafes are opening up. Almost everywhere you go now, you can find a pretty decent cafe. Um, and, and if they thought about it, they'll tell you Starbucks is the reason they exist. Starbucks convinced people to drink bad espresso and bad cappuccinos so that then they could be convinced to drink good ones. <laughs> but they would have never made the leap from bad drip coffee to $5 you know, cappuccinos if Starbucks hadn't sort of convinced them, right? Um, the fascinating notion on Starbucks about the notion of the space that a cafe should present. Again, a cafe should present a space where you can talk, where people can share ideas, where you can read comfortably. Very public, where you meet people. There's the element of the random, which I think is so important. This is what the salon does not have. It does not have the element of the random. It's generally carefully staged. The cafe has the element of the random. You never quite know what's going to happen or who's going to show up. Um, but if there's room for people to sit, again, not music that is too loud. This is another one. I'm not sure where this idea came from, that we want to be pelted with loud music all the time, but it seems to have spread like a virus. Uh, but, but many cafes are learning that you can turn it down a little bit, and that's okay. 
Um, and the chairs that are movable, I think this is the other thing that needs, because you don't know if you want to sit by yourself, you want to sit with two people, you want to sit with five people. Um, if you've seen like some cafes have these huge overstuffed couches and stuff, it looks comfortable, but you sit back in those chairs and the person you're talking to is like five feet away. Right? It, it, this, is, this, is not, this is not helpful. Right? It's, it's a mistake in the, you know, it's like, oh, let's make people comfortable. No, that's too comfortable. Right? You gotta, you know, bring it back a little bit so we can be close and intimate. Uh, but if you look around, I think you'll find these. I, I suggest, by the way, that you seek these out wherever you go. I was just recently in Atlanta. Several very nice coffee shops, although one of them had the music just blaring absolutely loudly. So it ruined what would otherwise have been, I think, you know, an excellent coffee shop. But people are clearly trying. They're flourishing, independently owned. They're focused on the coffee, but they're really focused on creating a space. And so they're all packed as far as every time I was there. So that means that people must be desirous of this, which I found heartening. Um, and I would say one note there, because I'm sort of, I go to a lot of coffee shops anytime I go anywhere besides here. Um, don't be put off either by like the hippie vibe, because some of the best coffee shops I've been to were just pure, like, I mean, really, you could just, the, the, the dope was just wafting out of the window, right? You know, coffee in quotes. Uh, but, but they tend to be very relaxed. The best coffee shop, right? Which is nice. The, 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 the best coffee shop I've ever been to is called the Runcible Spoon in Indiana. And uh, Indiana University was between my house and, and the campus, and so I would stop both directions every day. But the, the wait staff was so completely indifferent to you. Literally, you could sit there for 15 or 20 minutes and they would not come to your table. And this was hugely liberating. Because you never felt like you had to do anything. You could just sit there all day. They did not care because they might not help you all day. <laughs> and anytime someone who was not used to this place would sit down they would like get restless and they'd look around and then they'd go up and say you know do we order at the counter and they'd say no and the people would be like are you sure because we've been over there for like 20 they're like no your waiter will be with you and they're like are you sure and so you'd have to tell them no eventually eventually someone will be by to abuse you you just wait and sure enough someone would walk up and go what do you want and you're like ah and they're like you know and you're like well I was thinking like ah oh, crap and they just walk off Damn, but they would be back eventually. But it was liberating because despite the surliness, it was just really they were indifferent to you. And so you felt comfortable. People who are too much attention is bad. Right? You don't want the overly attentive because then you, you sort of feel rushed and you have things to do. No, the, the, you want to be left alone. Also, the other extreme, it, I, I've seen these like neo-modern glass and stainless steel, and you think, oh, that's going to be horrible. But somehow, some way, they sort of manage to make it work, usually by creating a very calm environment, very clean, calm, no clutter. <laughs> um, and so you really focus on the people you're with. But similarly, I've been in coffee shops that are like, oh, that looks great, that's going to be wonderful, and somehow they just, I don't know, I went to one coffee shop, but oh, look, it just it had the look like, oh, this is going to be perfect, leather chair, bright scale, not too much loud music, honest to God, styrofoam cup. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> That's a styrofoam. Are you realized? I was like, I want. They didn't have ceramic. They had nothing. They didn't have paper. They like, oh, we always serve it in styrofoam. I'm like, yeah. I mean, that was, I don't know why. It just just freaked me out. But anyway, but there is this impulse that people clearly have to return to the coffee shop, and I think it is precisely for this because I watch people in coffee shops because I'm there a lot, um, and this is what you see: social gatherings of all kinds. Liaisons of all kinds, networking of all kinds. Um, I, I'm off put by the fact that people show up with computers now. I never, I, it just, it, it, it grinds on me a little bit, but that's just because I'm a Luddite. Um, you know, com computers are the future, and what I realize is these people could be at home. Right? If you've got a $2,000 Mac portable laptop, you probably have internet at home. The impulse to come to the coffee shop is the social impulse. I could sit at home and do this, but it would be so much more pleasant if I'm a place where I can talk to people, have face, face, physical interaction with them, and where you never know what's going to happen. They can hack your computer. Or they can hack your computer, that's a good Is that one that can happen? So it is the more public element of that. So finally on this, what is added again is it is this forum for conversation 
taken seriously. The salon more seriously, the coffee shop slightly less seriously. But what history has demonstrated is these semi-public, semi-private spaces, again on this continuum, are necessary. Anytime you get these fluorescences, you get these. You have these there. You have the, the artists, the writers, the politicians, the thinkers meeting to discuss. How do you do that? It seems like the most natural thing in the world. It's not. Anybody who's ever tried to organize a meeting, you immediately realize, like, where? How do you do this? How do you contact everybody? Oh, and it just stops, right? Everybody's had this experience. It's just like, oh, eh, damn, right? This is what the cafe and the salons have provided historically, is these socially organized spaces where people from different classes, different outlooks, different backgrounds, with different gifts and interests and powers and capacities can come together and create something that singly, that the isolated humanist, scholar, whatever, working, could never achieve. This is why the government in Tehran wants them shut down. This is why the internet cafes all over the developing world are opening and being shut continuously. Because they're terrified of what they might achieve. Because it might be something different from what the government's interested in. This is the amazing space. This is why the Salon and Cafe, as an institution of the humanist society, has been so important for, you know, going on two or three thousand years now. So, Salons and Cafes, thank you very much. Okay.